that she's a dedicated mother of three lovely children. Um, she's very passionate uh, advocate for clean air, uh, particularly in marginalized communities. And she's going to talk today about her journey from maternal health <coughs> advocacy to a leading global black maternal health leader. So please, Agnes. Thank you. so much for having me. It's a real honour and privilege to be here just to speak about my journey and my story um, and I hope it resonates with, with you all in, in short. So I always say I'm the most least likely clean air advocate. I don't even know how that happened to me. It wasn't something I was courting. It wasn't something I was thinking about. If somebody had told me 10 years ago that I'd be flying the flag for clean air, I would have I would have thought that they were, yeah, just lost their marbles. And it wasn't because um, there was anything wrong with clean air. It just was not on my radar. It just wasn't something that I spoke about growing up. It wasn't a conversation um, that was just within my, my kind of environment. Um, so it just was not on my radar whatsoever. Um, so in, in short, a few things happened. Um, so I'm one of the most proudly South Londoners that you can get. So we start off with that. I'm a South London born and raised mother of three. And really, the long and short of it is I just want to make a positive impact on my family and my community in a sustainable way. And that's like a lot of the, the families in, in the community that I, that I come from. Um, but a few things happened. So one, as a, as a mother of three, I've, I've come through the kind of maternal health route and had different maternal health experiences. And when I gave birth to my third child, who is this cheeky chap, the reason I'm wearing crops actually is because I was trying to put them to bed and I broke my toe. Um, so it was actually my, 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 my third child. Um, when I gave birth to him, I received care that was woefully in, inadequate. And obviously at the time, I was very happy to not know that black women were at that time maybe five times more likely to die in pregnancy. Um, but what I did know was that I didn't want any women, any other woman or any family to go through what I had gone through. Um, and so that started my journey as a maternal health advocate. I sat on the maternal, maternity voices partnership um, for St. Tom's Hospital as, as a chair, advocating for service user voices. And, you know, during that time, it was really about what was going on in the hospital. So nobody was talking about the environmental factors, the systemic factors that are contributing to women being more likely to die. So as I started kind of embarking on that journey as a maternal health advocate, I started understanding that actually what some of the key issues are about maternal um, deaths and maternal inequalities, and that's across the board, of course, disproportionately in black community, but just across the board, is that um, women are presenting with symptoms and are only finding out how sick they are in, in pregnancy. So maybe there's been different, uh, different milestones where that has been missed and now they're pregnant and all of a sudden they're experiencing you know, different kind of respiratory problems or, or pains and the midwife will be like, oh, you know, you're pregnant, that's what happens. So it gets dismissed and, and by the time you know it, you know, they're knee deep in preeclampsia or there's another issue that's occurred or diabetes, uh, gestational diabetes, and they've been picked up late. And so that exacerbates kind of maternal health, not just the... Um, maternal health mortality that we talk about, but also morbidity. So that kind of whole experience of just getting sick in, in pregnancy. So I was like, why is no one talking about, why are we only talking about, it's like a triage service when you're pregnant and you're, and you're finding this all out. Why are we not digging deeper to actually find out why these women, particularly in particular community, but just in general, coming in to a hospital and, and, and being more sick? So that was my kind of first, um, first kind of question. Second parallel to that, as all of that was going on, my, my, my daughter, so my, my, my middle child, um, well, she's not my middle child, she's my first child, but she's in the middle there, there. Um, I was taking her to nursery, everything was fine, and we were going literally one route, and then she went to big school, and we were going down another route, and there was a tunnel, and all of a sudden, let's say she started in September, very happy, very excited, and by the October, she was very sick. Um, and you know she loved school and she just kept on getting sick and I was taking her off school and I was going to a doctor and they were just saying things to me like oh you know eliminate bread, eliminate milk, maybe she's allergic and over a nine month period she just kept on getting really really sick till one day I got a call from her school and they said you need to come and get your daughter, we're having PE and she's literally slumped on the side, you need to get her now. So I went and picked her up, 
put them in the car, and I said, okay, let's get some McDonald's just before, um, before lunch, and she hadn't eaten anything. She said she didn't want a happy meal. So then I was like, okay, I need to drive as quickly as possible because it's not like my daughter to ever turn down a, a treat. Anyway, when we got to hospital, it turned out that she had community-acquired pneumonia, which is, obviously, as you would know, one of the leading causes of, of death. Finally, um, they, they diagnosed her with asthma, and I had to really force for that because I kept on exp- saying to the doctors, maybe she needs an asthma pump, or she needs, you know, just something. And they were like, oh, no, she's too young, she's four, um, she, you know, we don't diagnose uh, children with asthma at that stage. So they kept on just making me eliminate until she got really sick. Interestingly, I live in the same borough as um, Rosemond, Kissy Deborah do, and, and so as you know, all of this was happening, I mean, I wasn't making any parallels at that time, um, but it, it kind of really sparked my, my whole kind of thought process that I could have lost my daughter at that stage. Um, nobody was listening to me during that whole journey. I kept on, on, on speaking out what is going on there, and we have this really kind of dangerous tunnel that all the children have no choice but to go through to get to school. So you can imagine there's a maternal health, literally that's going on in parallel to the experience I had with my daughter. So that, that all those experiences changed my life, and then I found out about a, a little girl in the same borough of me, as me who had sadly lost her life um, with a similar story as my own. So it, it didn't become an issue of air pollution anymore. This became a real social justice um, issue for me. It became like, how do I not know about this? And so from actually kind of having my head in the sand and, and not really being interested, it became, I, I had no choice, to, I couldn't unsee what was happening because it was happening in, in, in my life and also the lives of the women that I was now representing as a, a chair. Um, and so I always said, you know, with three children, sometimes they said, well, you can't, you can't be a mother and, and have a career. So I said, no, I'll make motherhood my career. So that's exactly what I did. Um, and so I started working at a national charity called Best Beginnings, really as, as, a, as a head of engagement, really advocating for parents across our parent panel and ensuring that the work that we were doing there was, was being fed by local communities. <coughs> I started writing, um, so as I was sitting on a few different kind of community uh, groups. Um, I was on the kind of maternal and perinatal mental health theme for, um, at, at King's, so it was National Institute of Health Research. But anyway, long story short, I wrote an article, and it was my claim to fame because it went viral. And I was like, I tried to tell my friend, I've gone viral because of this NIHR article. And I was like, be quiet, what, what's that all about? But within the NIH um, R world, it was really about why black women are not engaging in research and what can be done about it. And just really kind of giving that kind of story because what I felt at that time was, you know, all these things were happening to me in the, in my in my kind of community, and everybody was saying, oh, you know, we really want to reach out to people from you know black communities and brown communities. How do we do? How do we do that? You know, people don't want to engage with us. And I thought, well, I can't get them off my phone. I'm in all these WhatsApp groups. I'm having to mute everything. Like people do want to talk. Um, but at the end of the day, it needs to feel relational. It needs to feel that it's meaningful. It doesn't need to feel transactional. You know, nobody wants to feel like you're coming into their community just to extract pieces of information that you can then go over, go and take out, and say, oh, you know, I've done all this work, and you're getting all the accolades. And the people in the community are still very much at the same phase and stage. And, you know, I think for too long, that was what the research world looked like. So, of course, people shut down. So even when researchers were coming in and they had the kind of interest to come in and actually speak, even if it was from a, a kind of a really meaningful place, the communities are tired. And they're like, we're not, we're not going to emotionally invest the lived experience that we have gone through, you know, I, I can say from my own experience, you know, my daughter nearly dying, you know, having to kind of speak consistently to people, thinking that they actually care about it, when actually them, is just really about their pieces of work. Nobody wants to do that time and time again. Um, and so, for me, when I kind of started my journey then, it was really about actually, communities want to talk, but we need to change the language. You know, if you come into, you know, I'm from Lewisham, and you just start talking about air pollution, I'm not really, I wouldn't, well, I wouldn't have been so interested in that. But if you talk about maternal health, if you talk about me sitting in those little uncomfortable chairs in A&E for seven hours, and you're saying, like, actually, that's linked to something, that I am definitely going to be interested, because I'm the one on a Friday evening that all of a sudden I'm checking on my daughter, and she's sick. You know, so I started to understand that, actually, there was a disconnect between people who genuinely wanted to engage with communities 
and actually the way that communities want to be engaged and the language that we're using. So in, in 2020, everybody was always on Twitter, and I was like, well, you do know that most of the mums that you're trying to reach on Instagram. So all of these posts, all of these posts you're, you're doing, just little, little things like that, you're doing that on, on, on Twitter, it, it, that would only be in your own circle, it'll be circulated, because actually, those are, that's not where your, your people live. Equally, when we're talking about community groups, there's not a lot of air pollution groups, but there's so many mum groups out there on TikTok, on, on Instagram, on Facebook. And actually, they, to me, when we're looking at community engagement, they're the best groups to, to go to. Or even women groups, there's a, there's a group, for example, called Black Girls Hike. They have nothing to do with air pollution, but they're really about going outdoors. So then all of a sudden, if you're speaking to them about air pollution and how they can iterate some of these messages down about getting more people enjoying the outdoors and walking and, and so forth, you, you've met people where they're at, as opposed to taking your idea of what you think air pollution looks like and kind of implanting that and expecting people to change their lives around, some, <coughs> around, around that kind of issue. So I really took this as, as my kind of calling to really <coughs> make, make that, that kind of, um, those kind of, kind of parallels. I'll go into a little bit more about what we did with, with Black Child Clean Air because that's what it kind of um, delved into. But all of these, these different kinds of work, and this literally started from my daughter's experience. <coughs> And um, my and the experience of being a maternity voice partnership chair, so it's my one claim to fame because then Beyonce found me and she was here earlier this year. I am a beehive, by the way, for those that beehive for those that don't know, Gary, I'm literally on teeth. I've been talking to Gary for a while now. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they're, they're basically Beyonce fans. So um, Beyonce was here for her Renaissance tour and she was giving 10 organisations across the UK and Europe grants to continue doing the work that they did and the work that we were doing around Global Black Maternal Health around um, air quality also received one of her grants and one of her recognitions. One of her recognitions. So again, it's about when we're empowering communities, oftentimes, you know, my, as I said myself, I'm not a likely um, <coughs> clean air advocate, but actually once we understand the, the, the connections, we don't really need anybody else to be feeding in. I, I, I don't need um, everybody else not telling me what to do, I just need that support and direction where it needs to be because I, it's become my calling now. And, I, and there's so many people out there that once they understand how air quality is impacting them, but in a way that they understand their lives and their realities, they can go out there and be change makers and then make sure that that message is going out to the world. So Global Black Maternal Health, as I explained, I came in this via a kind of maternal health route. And as I was kind of advocating um, around all, all, all women from all different communities, I understood the issues that I explained that black women were nearly five times more likely to die. I understood that it wasn't just about what was going on in hospitals, but actually 80% of black communities are living in poorer communities, more likely to be exposed to air pollution. And I'm talking to Imperial, so I don't want to kind of say all of the things that you already know, but just even black Londoners are three times more likely to breathe illegal levels of air pollution, all these different kind of compounding kind of effects. And so I thought that actually we needed to create a global body where we can kind of look at what's going on in other different countries and really bring about that research, evidence base that is done by the community, for the community, um, as equals, as leaders, to be able to change the narrative. So that's what we did. Um, and the vision, again, was to put this back into the hands of black communities as leaders and change agents. And it's so important that this happens because oftentimes when I'm talking about this whole issue around communities not connecting, they're not connecting because it doesn't feel like it, 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 it's for them. I, I, I always share this story. It's funny but not funny, and you'll see why I say that, because there was, um, and I'm plagiarising, by the way, I know I'm at the university, but I, I, this story was on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> so I put that out there, so now it's not plagiarising. So what happened was there was this lady in America, and she was um, a, a mental health um, doctor, and she was the only black lady in the, in the ward um, with, with her colleagues, and a woman comes running to her and says, oh, you know what, my patient is really, really deteriorating. Um, when, we go, when we go past the room, we see her banging her head really aggressively, and it's, it's been continuous. And so, you know, the, the black doctor kind of really kind of dig, dig, dig deeper. And then in the end, she said, When you say banging your head, can you show me? She went, You know, banging her head like this, banging her head, banging her head. And she was like, Is she wearing a weave? Is she wearing a wig? And she was like, What do you mean? Is she? And she was like, Well, you do know that when black women are itching their head and they're wearing a weave, they bang their head like this, they don't itch it like this. And obviously, the woman was mortified. <laughs> um, but it's the point that because this one woman, 
understood the nuance of you know the black experience in that way it saved this other woman because she what, what the plan was to go and call the other doctors and the men in white coats come in put her down put all the injections can you imagine you're itching your head you're thinking you're itching your head in private and all of a sudden people kick down your door running with all the injections you're obviously going to be very angry you're not going to know what's going on they're going to be like calm down calm down and you're itching, and that later on, you find that like, kiss your itching her head. Now, obviously, the, the, the lady in question was mortified. She wasn't intentionally trying to cause any type of harm whatsoever. But it, it's, it, it's kind of what I talk about in the research. She didn't understand the cultural nuance of that. She didn't understand the context, so therefore she made assumptions, even though the data was all the same, because the data was that a woman was in her room, it's a mental health clinic, and she's banging her head aggressively. But obviously, she's been in the hospital for a long time, so she's not been able to go and redo her hair in the way that she needs to do to, to kind of alleviate all of that. So that's going to happen. And so when we're talking about making research more inclusive, it's not because it's a buzzword, it's because if you don't have people from the communities involved in research, as, as from, from inception, these kinds of mis um, errors happen. And you know, it can actually be a matter of, of, of life and death. So that was why it's so important to have global black maternal health. So that we can actually put out research, but understand the, the nuance around what the data says. Yes, they're facts, but there are, there are cultural aspects that actually paint the, the picture, depending on if you know that. So what did we do? We created um, the Black Child Clean Air Report. I sort of know if anybody, uh, <coughs> apart from Dana, has, has anyone known, knows about the Black Child Clean Air Report? Oh yes, you were there. <laughs> so what we did, um, one of our first pieces of work, was to actually, and it might sound like an obvious idea, but it had never been done before, was to actually go out to black women who were either pregnant or had children five years and under, and actually go out and speak to them and ask them what are their attitudes and their behaviour and their knowledge around air pollution in London. Literally, that was the, the, the basis. And it was really interesting because initially, when we were putting out the survey, we were like, Agnes, what are you doing? Air pollution, first of all, they couldn't get past that, and that's the case. Just do, 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 do the study. A few things happened. Number one, the more the women were kind of answering the questions, they were then messaging and saying, oh my goodness, you know, I've been going to A&E with my daughter, and now actually I think it's to do with air pollution. So even just by taking part in the study, actually started making them think differently around air pollution. And initially, they wasn't going to take part. Um, some interesting kind of insights came out, because what we found is that when we said, what, what's your kind of perception or your knowledge of, of air pollution for your own personal self? Around 17% said they knew nothing at all. But when we asked about how, how that kind of changed, you know, was in pregnancy or once their child was once born, that was at like 53%, 56% respectively. So you can see it was three, they were three times likely to not have any awareness once they became pregnant. I don't know if we haven't dig deeper to find out do they feel like once they became pregnant that protects the baby or, or those different kind of aspects around that. We, we haven't done further, further kind of analysis on that. But it was really interesting to understand just even the, that kind of insight that it changes dramatically once a woman becomes pregnant. And it's really important because, as I said, when we're looking at maternal health disparities and the kind of all of the, all of the impacts that air pollution has from preterm birth to, to miscarriage to stillbirth, and you may have seen just this week, black women went from being twice as likely to experience a stillbirth in the UK to three times more likely to experience a stillbirth. And that news just came out this week. So when we're looking at the kind of impact of, 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 of air quality and how it can exacerbate um, cause or exacerbate um, conditions, this is really life and death. What we also know is when we're talking about the leading causes of, of death for, for women in the UK, and this is across the board, irrespective of ethnicity, they're two things. They're cardiovascular heart disease and then they're suicide. And, and it's not just on the, when we're talking about um, the leading cause of death, we're talking about um, from when you're when you've given birth to one year afterwards. So actually most of the death is, is, is occurring um, postnatally, but in that really kind of early, early stage. And we know that air pollution causes and exacerbates cardiovascular heart disease. So a lot of these women probably don't even know that they're walking around with a, with a heart condition or, or a heart disease or that they're even at risk. And then only in pregnancy they're finding out all, all of these aspects. So our work was really about actually need a baseline to really understand, not just from my experience, which I've explained, but actually women you know, in, in London to understand what is their knowledge base. So when we're looking at recommendations, when we're trying to move that dial forward, we're doing that based on what the community are saying, not just based on what our assumptions are. Um, and so this quote, you know, for the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. 
They may allow us to, to temporarily beat him at his own game, but they will never enable us to bring about genuine change. And I think that's really important because the way that we're currently doing things within the environmental sector, I, I'm just going to be very blunt, I think it's quite poor when we're looking at engaging diverse communities. And I say that because if everyone's coming from a certain community, a certain time, um, <laughs> you're not going to get that diversity of understanding. You know, even for us, when we did the Black Child Clean Air um, report, just because I'm a black, but it wasn't just me showing up. We had a community group of other black women from different communities. And one of um, the community leaders, her name is Jennifer, she, she um, runs this group of Sisters in Business, which is the largest um, group for Muslim business women in the UK. She, I learned so much from her about, you know, when it's Ramadan and you're burning co um, coal, and actually how they can now do that in a, in a more kind of cleaner, way and, and so forth. I wouldn't have known that if I just thought, well, I'm a black woman, let me just go out there and do this piece of work. If I wasn't bringing different women alongside that and understanding their cultural nuances and their experiences and the way that they experience air quality. So now that's an, a lens. So when we're thinking about, okay, how do we now go and communicate air quality? We're going to communicate that in a culturally sensitive way that is, is, is relevant for people who practice their faith. Oftentimes, people kind of push back if you're coming in and, and telling people don't burn anything and you're thinking well actually I need to do that for my religious practice and you're just coming in and saying don't do that full stop but it feels it doesn't just feel like you're telling them what to do but it feels like you're actually going against the way that they, the way that they operate but actually if you understand how air quality impacts them both indoor and outdoor and the practices that they do and you understand why that's important and what they do and at what times but actually you can support them doing things in a more kind of cleaner and more efficient way so that was something that was really important to so really what I'm just trying to say here is that everybody here that is passionate about air quality, the way that we are doing things, it, it, need, it, needs, it, needs, to, it needs to broaden out. You know, when we're looking at the environmental sector as it stands, next to farming is the least diverse sector um, as, as it stands. And if we don't bring in those di diverse voices from education, from uh, industry and so forth, we're not going to bring about that change because we're not going to know those nuances. Um, and lastly, the way forward, community engagement, as I said, workforce and um, diversification, training and development, and then also funding when you're putting out those kind of grant um, reports. Don't just think about community engagement as a last thought, like, oh, now I've got my, my funding through to do that piece of work. Let's see how we can now kind of squeeze that in. Actually think about that and factor that in from the beginning. Thank you very much.